Good morning. I'm Shehoko Goto, Deputy Director for Geoeconomics with the Wilson Center's Asia Program. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, for those of you who are logging into an Asia Program event for the first time, a very warm welcome to you in particular. The Wilson Center was established in 1968 as an act of Congress to bridge the worlds of policy thought and policy action. The Asia program focuses on um, delving into uh, US interests in the Indo-Pacific and issues of mutual interest for both uh, the United States and Asia. Next week, central bankers and finance ministers from across the globe will be gathering in Washington, DC. The circumstances, of course, are far from normal with the pandemic still going on, but it, is, it does mark a return of Washington, DC as the host of one of its biggest annual events. And it signals that there is a return to normalcy of sorts. It will certainly be an opportunity for financial leaders worldwide to take stock of how the global economy has weathered disruptions caused by the pandemic, assess the outlook for growth since the COVID outbreak over the last uh, year and a half, and discuss ways forward in development assistance and of course, deliberate on um, the risks facing the global economy and the international financial system. There will certainly be no lack of issues to discuss at the IMF and World Bank meetings or at the G7 meetings and numerous sideline meetings uh, that will happen across next week. Over the next hour, we will be exploring not only what to expect in terms of statements and action plans from the IMF and World Bank, but we will also discuss what opportunities and risks loom large for the global economy. I'm excited to welcome back Meg Lumpsager, public policy scholar and former executive director of the United States at the IMF. Uh, she is also a former deputy assistant secretary for trade and investment at the US Treasury and played a key role in the process of negotiating China's accession to the WTO. I'm also delighted to be joined by Suman Berry, who is logging in from Toronto. He is a global fellow of the Wilson Center and a non-resident fellow at Brugel, the Brussels-based think tank. Suman was previously chief economist at World Debt Shell and was also with the World Bank based in Washington, DC, focused on Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, he currently wears many hats, including as Global Fellow at the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth, based in New Delhi, and he also serves on the board of the Shakti Sustainable Energy Foundation in New Delhi. So, let's get started. Um, in April 2020, uh, both of you uh, joined us here at the Center to have a Zoom panel discussion about what to expect from the Bretton Woods institutions as the world confronted challenges of the pandemic. At that time, fear of the no unknown about COVID prevailed and sheltering the global economy from the impact of the shutdowns and disruptions was paramount. Uh, there are many sobering projections about the global economy were made, financial markets were hard hit, the jobless uh, rate soared. But 18 months later, um, since that, that uh, conversation that we had, the IMF's projections for for global growth looks solid, if not downright robust. Um, the projections for uh, the latest projections by the IMF will be, of course, released next week. Uh, but as of July, uh, the global growth um, ex expectations for both the advanced and developing economies look steady, and growth in Asia is looking particularly strong uh, for this year. And that um, growth is expected to continue into 2022, albeit with a slight downturn. And all the projections appear to be above the baseline from pre-pandemic levels. So Meg, um, the IMF has talked a great deal about a return to normalcy or so-called vaccine-powered normalization. And they've come up with some fairly strong projections um, for this year and next. Um, it is striking to see that it's not just a return to pre-pandemic times, but actually exceeding those growth expectations. What are some of the factors driving this optimism? 
Uh, thank you, Shahoko, and thank you for inviting me to <clears throat> join you in Suman today. I think uh, what's powered a lot of this recovery has been, or the economic recovery, has been a tremendous effort by global central banks. You know, in the US, in Japan, in Europe, there's been a lot of support in terms of keeping a floor on their domestic economies, which helps keep the global economy growing. We've also seen as, you know, in many countries, not many others, uh, vaccination rates have improved. And so people are getting back to work. And what you saw, particularly in some of the advanced economies, is during the early parts of the pandemic, uh, we really couldn't spend any money. There really wasn't. So those people whose incomes were protected, who were working, and those who were benefiting from government support programs, which are pretty extensive in the U.S., we're able to then try and spend money. And by later in the year, there's been this burst of consumer demand. So that's helped keep us going in the United States, the government spending. Uh, now, a lot of this is winding down right now. So you see the um, unemployment benefits have, uh, are being reduced, eliminated in many cases. Uh, the Federal Reserve has said it's going to be slowing its uh, pace of buying uh, government securities, uh, still not raising interest rates this year, but there is a warning out there. And, you know, they're worried a bit about inflation. So there's a lot going on, a lot of risks, which we can uh, come back to. Um, but uh, I do think there's been uh, a bit of a surprise that the global economy has actually done pretty well. Now, with that said, the managing director uh, mentioned in her speech, I believe yesterday, her scene setter for the annual meeting, that the IMF will be shaving its growth projections from what it put out in July. So we'll all have to look for that next week. She didn't say a dramatic downward you know, revision to much lower, but they are pairing it back. And a lot of that has to do with the supply chain uh, disruptions that have impeded a lot of production from getting back online. So we talk, um, Meg's touched upon some of the factors that are keeping those numbers um, projections strong, um, not to do the good cop, bad cop, but what about the downside risks here? Um, we know that there is a great uh, divide between um, industrialized countries and developing countries um, that's marked uh, as a result of uh, the vaccination rate. Um, so the health crisis continues to impact uh, the world and it does um, exacerbate some of the um, disparities that have already existed. Um, Meg has also talked about a little bit about inflationary pressure and certainly as consumers, um, as well as at the macro level, we see the, the inflationary pressure uh, going up. And I think it's interesting that about an hour ago, the IMF released a chapter um, on um, inflation before the overall World Economic Outlook report is actually released next week. Um, and the IMF argues that the headline inflation uh, will continue to rise, but perhaps peak by the end of this year and we will see it return to pre-pandemic levels by the middle of 2022 um, in most countries. Um, is that, um, is, should cautious optimism really be a byword for what we are to expect moving forward? Or are we really going to see a, a bigger divide between those uh, countries that have um, been able to pump more money in to be vaccinated in those uh, countries that have not. That dreaded unmute yourself. Uh, uh, again, let me, um, uh, like uh, Meg, thank you for organizing these discussions. It's a privilege uh, uh, as a Wilson Center Global Fellow um, uh, to participate uh, and to. Uh, jointly with, with Meg. Um, look, um, you talked about risks in, um, you know, in, in the short term uh, or risks to, to global growth. I just like to frame this slightly uh, in, a, in a wider context. 
I think uh, David Malpass gave a speech in Sudan of all places where he talked of the challenge for of, of bringing development back onto the agenda. Now, through the first decade of uh, the century, uh, all of the buzz was about the inevitability of convergence, that emerging markets were destined to grow faster for all kinds of technical reasons. And so the gap between the emerging markets and the advanced economies would inexorably narrow. Then came the global financial crisis. And we had a period where China and to some extent India uh, maintained their standing, but a lot of other emerging markets kind of seemed to falter. So I think an issue that's facing us is whether and by what mechanism what we are seeing in the advanced economies will impact on uh, the non-advanced economies, let's put it this way, which also is a question of who is poised to be the locomotive of growth in the next phase. So is it the US? Can it be the US? Will it be the US consumer? Will it be the US government? Or, or, uh, will, or what would it take for leadership to pass back to the emerging markets? So I want to frame, as it were, the way I look at it in that context, and to say that what we're seeing right now is that the uh, growth impulse for the emerging markets is really a positive spillover from what Meg was talking about, unprecedented monetary and fiscal easing, most of all in the US, to a lesser extent in Europe. Um, and this is exhibiting itself in what's been happening in global trade. The issue then becomes, uh, you know, as those stimuli get withdrawn, are the emerging markets in a position, the large emerging markets in a position to uh, assume growth leadership again? And I think that's an open question that uh, you know, we could talk about. Um, locomotives for growth. I think um, I, I want to go back to this idea of um, countries later on. But let's talk a little bit about the role that the IMF and the World Bank have played to date um, in terms of, of debt reduction, in terms of um, increased financing, um, special drawing rights, SDR allocation. Um, has, in your mind, Meg, was the response from the IMF to date adequate? And what else can they do to further this momentum? Uh, thanks. The uh, <clears throat> response of the IMF was, I'd say, uh, very energetic, immediate. Uh, they started an emergency financing program uh, and were able to lend money to countries. Again, <clears throat> they have to ask for it without really any conditionality. And so, uh, there was a big benefit in terms of countries that needed ready sort of foreign exchange support, access to uh, uh, the ability to purchase needed imports. And so that was very positive. The IMF and the World Bank together set up this debt suspension initiative, debt service suspension initiative, which is ending this year. But it basically asked private creditors, excuse me, public creditors around the world to just suspend taking uh, interest and principal payments from the low income countries. And then the IMF on its own just basically granted uh, a much smaller group of countries the money to pay their debt service coming due to the IMF. So that was very positive, especially for the low income countries, strong support. Uh, now, in terms of the debt side, that's been a, a bit more of a challenge. And I think it'll be important to also look to the G20 meeting next week uh, in terms of the ministers and governors getting together to see what they agree on the common framework. Uh, 
which is this process by which a country can ask uh, its official creditors and hopefully bring along private creditors uh, to basically restructure the debt. And three countries have requested this, started the process, three in Africa. And um, it's been a bit of a, let's say, um, uneven start and hasn't really resulted in an outcome yet. And I think a lot of people are worried about in terms of will this common framework actually be able to deliver uh, debt treatment, debt relief to those countries that are getting into trouble. But the other thing the IMF has done recently is um, it has eased the, uh, <clears throat> or allowed low-income countries to borrow more under its facilities. And of course, the SDR allocation that the IMF uh, membership agreed this summer put the equivalent of $650 billion uh, in terms of SDRs into countries, foreign exchange reserves. Now, they don't all spend that at once. They can't really spend it per se, other than spending it directly at the IMF to pay their debt service. But they can try and exchange, they can request it to exchange it with uh, another member of the IMF for foreign currency and then use that for uh, whatever their needs may be. We don't know yet how much of that has happened because this allocation just happened in August. So we'll have to look at numbers you know, monthly as they're posted to see how countries... Uh, but the IMF has had a big push on use these SDRs responsibly. And the IMF leadership is pushing advanced economies, please channel your excess SDRs. You don't need them. Those of you who have dollars, yen, euros, you know, Canadian dollars, Australian dollars, you don't really need these. So please come up with, you know, join us in on lending these to the, um, those countries that need it more. So that'll be a big part of the discussion among the ministers and governors at the IMF meetings next week, how to do that. And it, it's not easy uh, for, I mean, central banks aren't typical donors or lenders like that. So <laughs> it's a, not in their nature. So, uh, you know, and SDRs are you know, a different kind of assets. So um, we'll see how much of a commitment we get and then what we actually do. I mean, the good thing is, is the, the US, the administration, Biden administration has requested in the budget for the next fiscal year, oh, the current fiscal year, <laughs> uh, the authority to um, actually lend on lend some of its SDRs to uh, the IMF, a facility for low income countries that already exists, or perhaps a new facility that's being discussed, this resiliency and uh, trust that the IMF is uh, working on. So um, we'll see what kind of announcements come out next week. But the IMF has been at the forefront of helping the low income countries with the World Bank and others, and in pushing the rest of us to do our bit to help the rest of the world, not just low income, but middle income countries as well. Simone, let me turn to you. Um, exact same question, but the World Bank's response. Um, I'm also hoping that you could talk a little bit more about the, uh, the debt suspension expiration and whether there should be uh, greater efforts to uh, push back the deadline, or what, uh, what other measures can be taken also. Um, if you can talk a little bit about um, some of the new programs that the World Bank has uh, come up with and its role in the vaccine rollout in emerging markets as well. Um, I, I'll do my best, uh, Shiko, Shihoko, but um, let me again uh, sort of uh, div uh, divide the world into the least developed countries, but broadly speaking, those who borrow from uh, Ida, um, uh, who were the beneficiaries of the DSSI, the debt sustainability, the debt, sus debt service suspension. Is there one more? Is there? Debt service suspension initiative. Um, and then, as it were, the larger group of emerging markets. Uh, let me, since uh, Meg has talked about the DSSI, let me just talk a little bit about the emerging markets. Um, and I know India best, and I don't know how typical it is, but the reality is that the flood of money unleashed by quantitative easing in the United States and in Europe and in Japan has meant, and the fact that we are still in a world in the advanced economies of very low 
um, uh, nominal interest rates and real interest rates, indeed, since inflation is going up, has meant that there's been a wall of private money coming at emerging markets. Uh, now, the question is, does, is this enough? Uh, is this a stable source of financing? Does it help the emerging markets to, be, to return to being locomotives of uh, future growth? Um, I, I'm not sure about that because if India is any, um, uh, any example, you know, there's a sense that this is hot money and that you've got to use it to build up reserves rather than it's being a stable source of financing for infrastructure uh, investment. So I would say that uh, many commentators have felt that while the advanced economies had the monetary space to do what they could, and there was an effort uh, by the fund uh, and the World Bank uh, under the uh, advice or guidance of the G20 to do something for the least developed countries, uh, the emerging markets haven't really figured all that prominently in the, uh, in the policy response. But let me, uh, uh, before I turn to other parts of your question, make two additional points on the emerging markets. The reality is that there are large parts of the emerging world, uh, or, many amongst the emerging markets, particularly in Asia, who are not, uh, unlike the Latins, are not, there's a stigma attached to, um, um, to seeking IMF assistance, okay? So whether the constraints are on the demand side or the supply side is difficult uh, to tease out. But certainly there's a sense that at a time when there are massive infrastructure needs, uh, and uh, in the emerging markets, that uh, uh, that the emphasis has been a bit more on adjustment than it has been on liquidity. Uh, the second point, uh, and this is relevant to both the emerging markets and the least developed countries, is that lending by the international financial institutions, the multilateral development banks, is debt and it is senior debt. It's not flexible debt. And so if some of these countries have an indebtedness problem, uh, you know, piling debt upon debt is not really a solution. Now to come to your question of what the World Bank has been doing, you know, I think even in the global financial crisis, the World Bank was actually, uh, uh, actually put out more money than the fund. I'm not really keep, uh, keeping tabs uh, at the moment. Uh, the great advantage of the World Bank is of course the very long tenor of what it, what it lends. Um, there are calls out there for the World Bank to be, and the other multilateral development banks, and here it would end up with the US Treasury, to be a lot more adventurous in using their balance sheet. Uh, uh, and not insisting on maintaining the AAA rating, et cetera. <coughs> but all of that is relevant if you think that the issues are really on the supply of finance rather than you know, uh, countries feeling that why on earth would we go for conditional finance when, when it's coming at us uh, through the equity markets? A long answer to a short question, but I hope it makes some sense. Back to you. Thanks. Um, to our viewers, I should remind them that we are taking questions from the audience uh, as this is a live event. Uh, you can either email us, um, the, and the email address is asia at wilsoncenter.org. Again, that's asia at wilsoncenter.org. Or um, you can tweet us um, at Asia Program. So you can tweet or you can email. Um, let me turn um, a little bit to the um, some of the political considerations and um, perhaps the political economy. And I'm thinking specifically um, at the moment about supply chains, um, which is of course um, an issue that has grappled both um, emerging markets as well as industrialized countries. 
Uh, we've seen an immediate shortage of consumer goods um, um, at the immediate onset of the pandemic, which was really less about the actual supply, but much more about the distribution of goods. Uh, but we've, you know, almost two years in, we've continued to see a shortage of semiconductors. Um, and we're concerned about uh, future unexpected disruptions uh, that could, is already leading to reconsideration of critical supplies. Um, of course, we're redefining what supply chains are, and it's not simply about cost effectiveness or efficiencies, but it's also about resilience. Um, but there is also that concern about resilience simply being another way of promoting protectionism and perhaps a new way of economic nationalism. So will this renewed effort to boost supply chain resilience help or hinder growth in the longer term? Well, I'll uh, <clears throat> go ahead and jump in, Shihoko. I mean, this is the real tension and you see it in uh, you know, governments around the world debating what to do about this because all of our countries have benefited tremendously from this enormous growth in global trade that we've had over the past uh, many decades. And it's really contributed to the development of many countries around the world as we've seen, particularly in Asia. I mean, you know uh, many of those examples very well, but um, you know, here we are in the US and they can't make cars because they can't get the semiconductors because every car is so computerized these days. So there's a big rethink in terms of, well, how much security do we need to focus on in supply chain issues? And it's gonna be very difficult because it'll be hard to get the private sector making a lot of goods <clears throat> that are much more competitively made around the rest of the world <clears throat> and then you're bringing up the question you just mentioned in terms of protectionism. And of course, we don't really want to go back to that and think we need to produce you know, a whole range of goods, everything domestically. But I do think um, there will be more of a focus and more government support for some of those industries that are deemed to be critically important for many different areas of production. But figuring out how to do that, which industries to support, uh, and where to draw the line, and then those that are outside the line uh, not being very pleased. So it's going to be a very tough question. <clears throat> and of course, now, you know, put into the mix what's going on in China in terms of how, you know, there's a clamp down in terms of leverage in China, borrowing by corporations. There's going to be more government ownership, more government interference in the private sector in China. So how that's going to be um, part of the global supply chain in terms of the response that China will be making to this. But, uh, you know, and then we just have the basic as we've seen in every newspaper every day, the container ships sitting outside uh, the ports and, uh, not being enough truckers and oil shortages. And so all these things just have, you know, mushrooming effects, multiple effects on down the chain. And then that leads people to hoard, you know, to do panic buying, to build up their inventories. And so uh, I think we've uh, moved away from just-in-time inventories now. Thanks. Um, so so uh, a few thoughts. First, um, you know, there is the issue of um, uh, uh, technological, um, uh, how should, uh, not protection, but uh, uh, technological certification. Okay? Now, this is something that has become uh, very apparent since the Trump administration in the relationship between uh, the US and China, but the Europeans are also have been have become much more concerned than they used to be about Chinese acquisitions of important um, uh, manufacturing firms with uh, proprietary technology. So uh, the first, uh, if you like, uh, departure from the world as we used to know it is on the issue of critical technologies. But again, as an Indian, let me say that this is not new. I mean, when India um, um, uh, chose not to join the, uh, the 
Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, uh, it was subject to uh, sanctions on, or the prohibition on so-called dual use technology, and that lasted all the way until India and the United States came to an agree, agreement uh, in the 2000s uh, to, uh, to lift uh, the, uh, the restrictions. Uh, so what I'm saying is that these restrictions have existed in the past. Uh, the issue seems to be that dual use today is much broader and more diffuse than it used to be. You know, it's probably the case that the iPhone 13 is more powerful than, uh, I don't know, you know, uh, uh, a centrifuge or, or something like that. So I think exactly as Meg has said, that even if you have these aspirations, how you actually police them is, is hard. Uh, the second um, kind of dimension of this uh, is, uh, as it were, involuntary supply chain disruptions, because we've just had, you know, uh, the mother of all uh, economic shocks in the pandemic, uh, which uh, has impacted on labor force, it's impacted on where containers have ended up, it's impacted on the people at the ports available for Steve Doring, and, you know, a whole set of logistical risks that people, you know, had chosen to overlook or ignore have now suddenly um, sort of uh, risen to the surface and people, to use the hackneyed phrase, are moving from just in time to just in case. And uh, that means diversification. And so, uh, I don't see much evidence of people moving away from China, but they are certainly looking at Vietnam, to some extent India, as alternatives to China, and not just for geopolitical reasons, just the idea that diversification is uh, insurance. Okay? Then there's supply chains and what you talked about earlier, which is inflation. So, you know, uh, the there's a debate going on, particularly amongst American economists uh, or economists in the US on whether uh, long run interest rates and long run inflation are something you can count on and that therefore you really don't want, need to worry about debt. You really don't need to worry about uh, inflation in the long run and you can spend and you should spend. Uh, the main uh, voter, uh, vote, uh, exponent of this is of course, Olivier Blanchard at the Peterson Institute. And then people like you know, Larry Summers um, who are arguing that these supply chain disruptions, quite apart from anything else that climate change may bring about, mean that there is, and also demographics by the way, mean that there are structural forces that may mean that low inflation will not be here to stay, which means that monetary policy tightening may be closer than we might imagine. And then there are negative kind of spillover effects as that starts to happen as we began to, uh, began to uh, discuss. So supply chains, I think uh, the world of the future is not going to be what we had got used to, but what the impact of that is on productivity, productivity growth, because it could be that it stimulates innovation, I don't know, but uh, it is putting sand in what had become a very well-oiled machine. And indeed, some of what the Asians are attempting to do in trade policy uh, through agreements like the RCEP, and you know more about this than I do, uh, you know, are attempts to, as it were, bring the, uh, uh, bring or, or to protect, as it were, the efficiency of the uh, uh, of the supply chains within that region. Over to you. Thank you. Um, you've provided a lot of food for thought, both of you. But let me, um, since it's been raised, let me let me turn to trade. Um, we are seeing um, a, a great deal of, of change 
in many things, in supply chains, in um, how we uh, assess human capital. But of course, when it comes to trade, we have these uh, trade agreements that are emerging, especially in, in Asia, namely through the CPTPP and RCEP, the, uh, the Comprehensive and Progressive TPP, as well as RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement. Uh, the irony, of course, is that although both um, espouse um, a commitment to uh, free and fair trade, uh, the biggest um, democracies of the Pacific region, that is to say the United States and India, neither of them are actually party to this. Um, what are the implications, Meg, um, for the global economy, for the two biggest democracies of, of the Pacific to not be part of it? Is, we, we talk about, we had talked about you know, the economic benefit or lack thereof of the United States joining TPP initially, um, that the argument for um, economic, um, the economic um, case for CPTPP is far weaker than the case for the, the political um, and security and diplomatic need um, for it. Is, is there a stance that the IMF takes or the World Bank takes in encouraging countries to, to join trade agreements? Or is that too political and it's just not something that they would not be involved in? Well, that's interesting you bring up that angle because the uh, IMF really is not at all enthusiastic about regional trade agreements. Uh, their focus is it should be global, should be global benefits, should be open to all, uh, work through the WTO, of course, there are a lot of challenges working through the WTO that we're all very familiar with. And I think that's you know, because the WTO couldn't reach agreement and many times that the, the US then opted for things like you know, NAFTA, now the USMCA and other agreements and a lot of bilateral agreements. I mean, Shahoko, you'll remember well how I thought it was terrible that the US walked away from the Trans-Pacific Partnership and had an agreement that covered services, other areas, was really something that would have been very helpful for encouraging those kind of reforms opening up in uh, many of the countries in Asia. So now we're on the outside and uh, joining any agreement means we have to negotiate if we want to join. So. Uh, negotiate with the others, make concessions, whatever, and then the current agreements are not as broad as what uh, it was planned in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So um, I'm not sure the U.S. is going to be doing that, but it is unfortunate that we self-excluded ourselves. Um, with that said, the U.S. is still a big market. Countries are still you know, anxious to maintain access here. So I expect that um, We'll continue to make progress on a bilateral basis. I mean, I think things are much better in terms of relations with India these days. Suman, you're probably more up on that than I am. And of course, you know, our longstanding uh, close partners in the Pacific, uh, I think that'll be sustained as well. So I hope that can keep, you know, positive developments continuing on trade and, and not a, you know, erecting a lot of, uh, protective barriers because we think we need to uh, handle everything here. So uh, threading that needle is going to be very difficult. And I think it'll be a real challenge for uh, any US administration to figure out how to move forward on this, You know, having deeper trade relations with countries that you feel are reliable, but then you're also going to be worried if uh, goods have to be shipped across a very big ocean and what other issues might be involved. So um, I think it's going to be something we're all gonna be challenged with, but the bottom line is US producers, US consumers are good at finding you know, the lowest cost and they're gonna to wanna to continue doing that. So, and that of course benefits the US economy in terms of freeing up resources for other things. So um, I think that's right. something Shahoko, the Wilson Center and many others are going to be focused on for years to come. Uh, and I think keeping an open mind and keeping a focus on the benefits of trade and the relationships and the benefits to the rest of the world moving up the development chain as a result of trade are something that we should always keep in the forefront. Yeah, 
Uh, just two quick points, uh, Shehoko. It was fascinating the way you characterized, uh, you know, uh, the U.S. and India's relationship. Uh, let me just say that uh, the uh, distrust that President Trump and Bob Lighthizer had for trade agreements and uh, uh, preferential agreements, of course, they went ahead and renegotiated USMCA is absolutely echoed uh, in, uh, by the Modi government, or was for a while. There was a sense that basically uh, um, that, uh, the US and India had not benefited, they'd been taken to the cleaners, and that they had been weakened by signing these trade agreements. There's not a shred of evidence for any of this, but that is the mindset, I would say. So in that, it is in that respect that we are two large, prickly, inward-looking uh, democracies <laughs> who don't, well, uh, even though we both benefit from openness and have benefited from openness, find it difficult to make the case. And I think uh, it is going to be, it certainly seems to be the case that under the Biden administration, uh, that's not going to be a priority. I understand that the USTR made a very important speech at CSIS a few days ago. I still have to catch up with that, but I don't think it was a clarion call for, uh, you know, for openness. Uh, so that's point number one. Point number two would be that let's just, you know, uh, look at reality. The three uh, vortices, if I could call it that, of global trade, China, the US, and the EU, you know, have a, you know, they are they are the pillars of world trade. Do any of them have a preferential agreement with the other? No. And yet, you know, they uh, uh, they have been responsible for, as it were, the creation of uh, this very buoyant trading system, at least up till 2008. And so that always raises the question for me that look, you know, uh, what's the substance of these PTAs at the end of the day? They certainly, you know, uh, make good political copy and they gum up the, uh, the global trading system. And, um, uh, but at the end of the day, is there really significant trade diversion? Is there market access? What I would say is that, uh, you know, the customs union represented by the EU does represent a set of trade barriers. So there are benefits, I think, to negotiating with, uh, with the EU. And uh, India and the EU are, uh, are, have reopened their negotiations. I'll make the third point, which is that, uh, you know, Australia and China are both members of RCEP. But the last time I looked, they were busy fighting each other, and I'm not sure. Maybe the dispute settlement elements of uh, RCEP are not yet in place, but it doesn't really augur very well, um, you know, when the, the kind of uh, um, bullying or whatever you know, I forget what the term was that the uh, coercion uh, that uh, the Australian Prime Minister talked of uh, in response to. Australia's demand that China's, uh, that there be an investigation into the source of the virus, and that this has resulted in all kinds of uh, odd ad hoc uh, kind of trade measures. So I would say that, you know, this is more uh, sound and fury on the whole. And that um, what will be very interesting now, now that Japan is in pole position on CPTPP, how they uh, we have a, a, a bowling action in cricket called a googly. So how they react to the googly being bowled at them with China uh, choosing to apply formally to join the CPTPP, which I think they're doing out of a sense of delicious irony. So net-net, I think that um, uh, uh, neither India nor the United States should feel terribly worried, but it is the case that the agricultural um, you know, protocols of the TPP were designed to provide market access to the Japanese market for US farmers. And now other people are cleaning up like the Australians. So 
there is a cost uh, to the US of having having opted out and and uh, it seems uh, needing to stay out of the of the CPTPP. I don't know if you have views uh, because you're close to the Japanese on how they see it. Uh, maybe you do. Yeah. Um, so we could really continue this conversation just on trade for for, for a long time. Um, but um, yes, is the CPTPP the China? Uh, conveying interest, Taiwan too, wanting to join a week afterwards too, that adds another wrinkle. But um, I, I see your point, Simon, about um, trade continues with or without official trade deals. Um, but at the same time, there is certainly a cost to be paid by certain industries that are um, going to have to pay a price um, for not being part of, of, of an agreement. We certainly saw that with the US agricultural sector um, when before it had that bilateral agreement with Japan um, once uh, CPTPP went, went into effect. Um, but I do want to, um, I do, well, one, I want to get to some of the questions that we have from the audience. Uh, but before I do that, I also want to raise a somewhat um, uh, provocative issue, um, that is to say some of the um, uh, domestic, uh, internal, um, issues facing the IMF and the World Bank as well. Um, so I'm thinking is in particular about um, the World Bank's publication called Doing Business, uh, which is a report that is pub, uh, produced by the World Bank annually that gauges the ease of doing business in different countries. Um, and it should really incentivize countries to push through uh, reform and the like to attract foreign investors. And it has been seen as the tool to do just that and, and a really, really big seal of good housekeeping on the part of countries that rank highly. Um, but we have seen uh, that um, there had been pressure from countries like China um, for the World Bank to reassess some of their ratings, um, which the World Bank under the leadership of Jim Kim um, had actually adhered to, and um, as well as his deputy at that time at the World Bank, uh, Kristalina Georgieva, who is now the head of the IMF. As a result, there's a lot of talk about um, you know, uh, the IMF's uh, leadership uh, taking responsibility or take the publications like The Economist have called for her to resign outright. Um, there is, you know, there's a lot of speculation on what happened, what can be done. Um, are these concerns about uh, the legitimacy of some of the IMF reports or the World Bank reports warranted? Um, what can be done to restore confidence in, in the data and the information that is complied by, compiled by the Bretton Woods institutions? Meg, should I go first on this as a... Sure. For, for former bank staff uh, in the research department for a while as well. Uh, look, um, uh, what was that line from Casablanca? I'm shocked, shocked that um, countries uh, might take an interest in, in these measures. Um, I mean, to treat the bank and fund as universities uh, is, uh, is to be naive, okay? Now, I happened to be um, at the World Bank when McNamara uh, sort of saw that knowledge and data could be a very important contribution that the World Bank uh, made to the process of development because, uh, you know, uh, before that, it was a project lending institution. He made it a country institution. And then, you know, because he was very empirically driven, he said, we can't make policy without data. And so that was the origins. And, you know, we've, we've seen this now. I would say that that was probably 76, 78, something like that. So uh, we've had 40 years of this. And then the fund, of course, started to develop the WIO and all of that. Now, um, uh, I think two points. 
One is it is entirely appropriate for uh, country chairs uh, to express an opinion on, you know, on indicators. They know their countries quite well. I think that should be a part of the due diligence process. Um, and uh, second, uh, there, uh, there is something called Goodhart's Law that an indicator that is used for policy, uh, you know, gets corrupted. He was talking about monetary policy, but it applies in this case as well. So I think that the tension is in 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 the in the corridors of the World Bank is you know do you want to issue something like this as a contribution to to national to to national debate or do you actually want to trumpet this as being you know received truth because the 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 extent to which you do that then the pressures are going to build up on you. I mean, I do think that there are solutions in terms of firewalls and um, you know, uh, external review committees and things like, uh, things like that. But my own, uh, I have a sense of regret that following this investigation, I don't quite know why the investigation was undertaken, that the decision of the World Bank was to just drop this rather than say, okay, We've, that this has been useful, countries have found it useful, the data that we gather has been useful, let's see how we can improve the product. So I think that there is, again, uh, more, that there's more sound uh, than is justified. I think putting in protocols uh, so that there is the same degree to some extent of uh, academic freedom as you have in a university. But to insert that into an international bureaucracy is not going to be easy, particularly one which is ultimately the creature of its, uh, members, uh, of its membership, which is sovereign nations. Okay. Uh, that's all I have to say. All right. Um, well, I would agree with you on that that point, Suman. That I, there, there's a lot in the doing business report that's really important in terms of how private business can operate in a country. And as we all know very well, a country's long run growth and development rests on getting private sector activity. You know, governments can't generate all the demand, all the activity in a country. So you've got to be able to set up businesses. People have to be able to borrow. They have to be able to hire. They have to be able to get a phone line, get an internet connection, all those things that, uh, and to have a legal system that protects their investments. So all this was part of that report. And I think it was useful for countries. And then, you know, they could ask for technical assistance, work on trying to improve some of those conditions that would then encourage more private sector activity, both on the part of their own citizens, investors, but also on the part of uh, international investors. So uh, I agree with Sue, and I think there's some way they ought to be able to figure out how to, how to continue with some of the same objectives, even if the, um, the way they go about doing that needs some improvement. But secondly, I also agree with Suman in terms of, you know, country representatives on the uh, IMF, World Bank, any of these boards, of course, they're going to express their country's views. And that was one thing that I tried mightily when I was at the fund. Yes, I would make the case for what the U.S. is doing, U.S. policies. I'd certainly point out anything that I thought was outright incorrect, which was rare. But other than that, my point of view was to let the fund say what it had to say about the US economy. And every year the IMF examines each or almost all economies. It's called the Article 4. Suman, you're very familiar with that. And so I tried with Treasury and the Fed, and they really didn't, you know, call me up and say, oh, you've got to get that deleted, or you've got to get no. It's basically let the IMF do its work. And so by basically trying to accept that the IMF should be independent analysis, speak their mind, 
we get to speak our mind. Every Article 4 has country views in it too. You know, the staff makes its recommendations, the country authorities respond. So it's really important to recognize that. And, you know, the fun, sometimes staff change their mind over time when they see that the country authorities maybe were doing something a little differently and it worked. But as I heard from many of my board colleagues, there's a lot of commentary on the US economy out there and the whole world does not hang on what the IMF says about its country. Whereas for smaller countries, that may not be the case. And they would take what the IMF had to say about them very, very seriously. And it could have a big impact in the domestic market. So I think on their part, there might be a little bit more pushback on things, but uh, this is something that, you know, the IMF staff management and the countries, you know, they need to work on together. And I think there's been really much improvement in terms of letting the IMF do its analysis, whether it's in the uh, World Economic Outlook or the, um, you know, for, for instance, fiscal monitor commenting on all our fiscal activities, that the IMF has been able to do a really good job at putting its views out there pretty impartially. And so I'm um, counting on that being sustained and being recognized by ministers and governors when they're here next week. Great, thank you. Um, we're actually running short of time. So let me take a question from Mahesh uh, Kotecha, who is a advisory council member of UNCDF who says, common framework is a misconceived it is misconceived as it imposes a default on private debt for public sector debt relief, turning off the largest source of funds. It is shooting yourself in the foot. Do you agree? The goal should be to crowd in and not crowd out the private sector. Uh, I'll jump in on that. The point of the common framework is when a country is in a situation where it's likely to default and cannot meet its obligations. And so official creditors are agreeing, we hope, we'll see what the G20 comes up with next week, you know, pushing their own institutions to participate, you know, certainly publicly owned institutions, but also trying then to push private sector to give a break. Because it's very difficult for official creditors to grant relief or provide new money if the money immediately goes out to pay Private, external private sector creditors and is not used to actually try and generate economic recovery in that country that's obviously in dire straits if it has requested help under the common framework. So um, it's important then that the country set in place the kind of policies that hopefully will then, you know, sooner than later bring back the private sector and frankly, over many years experience, I've found the private sector memory to be a little bit more short lived than I would have expected. So um, yes, the focus is on bringing private money back, but the common framework is when a country really is in dire straits and then the private sector is gonna to have to be part of that solution as well. Thank you. Chair, I don't think I have anything to add if you want to squeeze in one more question. Um, thanks. So we, Time is running short, um, and I, I actually have to say we have received quite a few questions about climate change. So I would be remiss if I didn't uh, actually ask that. Let me try to pose it in a way that might um, make it easier for you to answer in like a minute or less. Um, so we, we have um, the COP26 coming up in Glasgow. We've just had an announcement of the Nobel Prize for Physics going to scientists who are quite trying to quantify how human activity contributes to climate change. There's obviously a lot of interest um, and there's a, a lot of questions about what the solutions can be. How can the IMF and the World Bank actually be part of the solution? Uh, quickly, the IMF is thinking exactly along these lines. Uh, one of the things it's talking about in terms of channeling SDRs is this, uh, resiliency and sustainability trust. And part of that would be to help countries adjust to climate factors that are going to lead to changes in productive processes, you know, rearranging how their economy uh, operates and is managed. So the IMF is very focused on 
the economic costs of climate change and how to help countries uh, be better prepared to handle that. I would just say, um, am I, yeah, uh, <coughs> as I see it, to come back to where I started, uh, it is going to be impossible to distinguish between overall economic development and, uh, if you like, uh, climate friendly development. So, uh, what we know is that developing countries are contributing to the achievement of a global public good. And I think that uh, the, uh, you know, the role of the bank and the fund is not only to be financiers, but to be honest uh, brokers, reporters on what is actually happening on climate finance. So I think there's a direct role, there's a catalytic role, and there's an informational role and I, again, as somebody coming from an emerging market, there's a, a need to tell truth to power because when these cops come around, people are always beating up on the emerging markets, but it's not clear to me that the advanced countries have such a good story to tell. So I think to, um, uh, to uh, be credible scorekeepers on climate and climate finance, are important roles, I would say, quite apart from the direct financing. Great. Well, thank you to you both. I'm afraid um, the time has come for us to wrap up this conversation. I know there are, we've only touched on a few of the many topics that will be covered uh, by the central bankers um, and finance ministers next week. Um, I hope we can turn to you again um, as we continue to monitor what the Bretton Woods institutions are doing and, of course, the, um, the, how the global economy fares moving forward. Uh, but for now, um, if um, thank you again uh, for uh, joining us. Um, thank you to our audience for logging in. I would also like to thank my colleagues in the Asia program. Um, Lucas Myers and uh, Mary Ratliff, um, as well as the team from uh, the AV uh, group in the Wilson Center, um, especially Tracy Fitzgerald and Sharona Harris for, for making this possible. So hopefully we'll see you again soon. Bye-bye for now. Thank, Thank you. you.